Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon sessions for the Smart Buildings Exchange. Uh, my name is Stan Price, and uh, I'm with the Smart Building Center, and I'm going to be serving as um, your moderator today. Today's session is going to be uh, is organized to be a little bit different than some of the uh, other sessions that we're doing at SBX, and that we're going to be having a live demonstration uh, of smart building technologies. Uh, and so I'm going to be turning this over to Craig Engelbrecht in um, just a moment. I do want to mention to the audience that the Q&A function in Zoom is available for you to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation today, and we'll do our best job to monitor that and pass along those questions and try to address them. The chat function is also enabled. We don't monitor that, um, but if you would like to send chats to one another or add to the conversation, uh, I know a lot of uh, attendees uh, like that uh, interaction. So. Uh, please feel free to uh, to to use that. Uh, before I introduce Craig, I will say that um, we um, had hoped and planned uh, to have a co-panelist with Craig, uh, Jay Martin from uh, Overcast Innovations. Unfortunately, uh, during the night last night, uh, Jay uh, felt a, a little peaked, and, and so he won't be able to uh, join us today. So uh, it'll be uh, we're going to be leaning on Craig uh, to both. Uh, provide information that he had planned on and actually doing a little pinch hitting uh, to um, step in and provide a little bit of some overview information that Jay uh, had also uh, put together. So um, we wish uh, Jay a, a speedy recovery, but uh, Craig, I'm so glad that you could uh, join us. Uh, Craig is the vice president with Long Building Technology. Uh, he's a master systems integrator of uh, smart building technologies and is a not only a longtime friend of mine, but a longtime uh, colleague and uh, person in, the, uh, in this world. Uh, and so I'll, I'll let him uh, actually give more background, uh, but I will turn it over to you, Craig, and uh, we'll start this process of um, showing us a little bit about um, what we have in store today. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Or Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for not being here, I guess. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> uh, we're missing Jay. Uh, so I'm sorry, everyone. You kind of stuck with me. Uh, but we're going to go through some really cool stuff, exciting stuff, and, and practical things uh, that are very... Uh, uh, you know, they're today's technologies, not future. And so wanted to uh, uh, just give you a little bit about who Long is as I start off here. <clears throat> Long Building Technologies, uh, we are Master Systems Integrator uh, and HVAC Controls and Security Solutions Company. We cover, um, we're covering seven states uh, based out of Denver, Colorado. I've uh, been around for over 60 years. We have over 500 employees, uh, fairly large company, yet also in the grand scheme of things, we're still very small and entrepreneurial, which is what's exciting because it's really given me the ability to, uh, here in Seattle, uh, be able to build some of these uh, next generation uh, solutions with existing technologies. And so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and going through. So what I would love to do is um, I'd like to stop and you guys are going to be along for the ride. We're going to do a live demo of our office. So going back six months ago, uh, almost a year ago, we started doing a TI in our office and we started putting some of our own stuff in our office uh, and, um, and implemented more of the technologies and integrated solutions to be able to showcase what can be done. So that's what we're gonna to do today. So I'm gonna go ahead, we have another camera. I'm gonna have a... All right, is everybody able to hear me? You good, Stan, can you hear me? Yes. All right. All right, we're gonna start outside. Um, we're gonna come outside. And a big part of uh, 
a smart building, smart offices is, is looking at the occupant experience, not just energy, not just comfort, but what is the experience? And so one of the really cool technologies um, is our access control. And the access control um, actually has uh, touchless. And so I can walk up, I can wave my hand. I don't have to take out my phone out of my pocket and it unlocks the door. So when you've got your backpack and you got your cup of coffee and all that, you just wave your hand and it's running on the background and it knows, hey, uh, uh, go ahead and unlock the door. We also have integrated. So when you're looking at, uh, you know, intercoms, it's an integrated intercom. Uh, it's kind of like your your uh, Nest uh, door ring doorbell where it's all integrated together. When, when I come into an office, uh, quite a few things start to happen. And one of the interesting things is our cameras. Uh, we've got cameras around and one at each door. And the camera technology is very uh, sophisticated with analytics anymore. And you can, on the picture, draw a line of that space. And so when I, I walk in the door, it actually counts the number of people coming in and the number of people going out. So we have a total uh, totalization of occupancy of how many occupants come into the space and how many go out of the space. And then at midnight every every day, it resets to zero in case there was something that went, uh, didn't count and tally up uh, exactly correct. Um, another couple of things though, with a smart office is that occupant experience is also visitor management. And when you uh, think about visitors and you want them to come uh, to your office, um, if you can issue mobile credentials ahead of time and even issue uh, the ability to go to um, register early on, um, here I've got, um, oh, I gotta find it here. But earlier today, I issued myself a visitor credential and I will, pull that up, but it gives me a QR code and uh, my QR code on my phone issues this. And it also gives me a visitor pass to unlock the door. So when I come to the office and I first get here, uh, of course, when we demo it, uh, we don't have this online. But when you walk up, I can walk up and enter in my QR code and it'll automatically register me. And then I can take my picture and I can uh, print off my badge. So not only is are you changing the experience for the, the visitor with uh, how they check in, but you're also changing it with the access control. So it's all integrated together uh, so that they can actually enter in spaces that you've given them access to for specific timeframes. Um, one of the other interesting things is uh, integration wise is, uh, is being able to greet guests. So when I walked in, uh, we have the ability, we have speakers that are power over ethernet speakers that um, are all connected to the web. And they're very simple speakers, just like you would. But instead of connecting with speaker wire, we're connecting over the internet uh, or on the network. And you can play WAV files, so like that. Just in, uh, uh, when the access control uh, is triggered and somebody walks in, it welcomes you. Uh, you can differentiate to even say, "Hey, you're a visitor. Welcome. Uh, please sign in uh, at the guest registry." Right. So you could start to use that technology and experience between speakers and uh, access control in this case to create a, uh, an occupant experience. Um, you can also use those speakers to be able to integrate when there's announce annunciations or when there's alerts or there's issues, uh, you can start to use that from a mass notification uh, and, and other ways to use the speakers. Right now, the speaker has actually got its background music playing. Uh, you can also use it for white noise, and we've got it integrated for uh, the same HVAC schedule uh, and lighting schedule for occupancy for the space is all tied together. 
So the the, the um, sound masking, white noise is tied in with the same schedule for occupancy. Um, what's really interesting too is we we changed out our lighting. We put in all new LED lighting in uh, our entire office space. Uh, one of the things that we did though uh, is we completely eliminated lighting control system. The lighting control system uh, is usually another system that you have to manage. People typically don't even uh, get taught how to use it. Uh, and then it just sits there and it's kind of a pain. Uh, so what we did instead was uh, we specified all the LED drivers to be dim to off. And then we were able to, which is the key, dim to off. We were able to put all our light fixtures in with the dim to off drivers. And then we removed every light switch from the entire office. Uh, and we wired the light switch to our HVAC controls and the light fixture, uh, the LED driver to our HVAC controls. So now it's the same HVAC control system controlling space for temperature and everything else, but now you're controlling lighting. And so here you could see, uh, now we have a uh, light switch. This is our light switch. So I can turn it on, I can turn it off, uh, and I can set the uh, uh, level. I can also use it, it's my thermostat. I can use it for blind control and I can have custom action. So I can say, let's go by motion. Let's go by uh, light level. Let's go by ambiance. And we can set different scenes uh, specifically for the lighting. And so this gives us the ability to unify systems and eliminate an entire system that you typically have uh, in your space. Um, one of the, the, the challenges is, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the challenges and how you have to think about that uh, early on. Um, kind of a fun one, uh, we implemented in our new office uh, space here, uh, a kegerator. And what we also implemented was access control tied to the kegerator. So for me to be able to do a pour, I have to swipe my hand and then it releases a solenoid and allows me to do a pour. Now we can count how many pours each person has done and uh, we can actually eliminate or limit the number of pours an individual does. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about using access control or using certain systems uh, to integrate and uh, and be leveraged with others. Um, leak detection. So there's these little sensors here. You can see this is a small sensor, and this small sensor is uh, made by Disruptive Technologies. And what's really cool about it is this small sensor. Uh, and this one in, in particular measures water. And so we have this typically in our kitchen on the floor, but let's just say someone spilled and it was overflowing here um, and the sensor gets wet. The moment the sensor gets wet, uh, it now notifies me via email and it notifies me with uh, on my app. I immediately get that there's a kitchen water sensor and it'll show that kitchen water sensor and the corresponding video. Now the camera is up a little high, so it doesn't see us in particular, but it gives the ability to now check in with your cameras from a leak detection immediately. It can also notify the HVAC controls uh, so that we can uh, look at turning water off for a pump or, or a valve or something else, which we're doing with a, uh, a affordable housing customer as well. Uh, so the ability to integrate things like little sensors to be able to catch leak detection. Uh, we're also using another one of these sensors in a door jam. It's a proximity sensor. So as someone goes in and out and that door closes and opens, we're counting the number of cycles on that door. So we can then think about proactive preventive maintenance. How soon should we do preventive maintenance? When's the end of the life cycle of that? And that's all integrated in uh, to our access control system 
uh, as well, giving us those, those door counts so we can then plan as a, accordingly. Uh, so the, the the amazing thing is there's temperature, humidity, uh, proximity, other sensors, and these are 15-year uh, battery life. Uh, so they work really well, and they're really small uh, to be able to leverage. Another key thing that we see business cases in is uh, environmental sensors. Uh, there's this sensor right here you can see on the ceiling. It's called a halo sensor. And you can see it's got a color. It's actually got uh, 13 different sensors inside of it. Uh, it's got PIR, motion detection, vape and smoking, vape with THC, masking of vape detection, uh, aggression, keyword, gunshot, tamper. Uh, and then it's got a health index and air quality, uh, particulate matter 10, 2.5 and 1, ammonia, nitrogen dioxide, carbon dioxide, CO2, total uh, VOCs, uh, CO, temperature, humidity, light level, sound level, and people counting. So a lot of sensors all smacked into one, one sensor uh, cluster. And what's really great right now, uh, we're simulating air quality. So if the air quality is off, uh, we can have it show a certain color. Uh, and then if we want to uh, uh, signal when someone vapes, so in school districts, uh, public restrooms, certain places where you don't want uh, vaping or smoking. Vape detected, security notified. Vape detected, security notified. So you can see, detected. Security notified. you can see it change colors security. and it's now audible. And so you can have an audible note uh, audible uh, uh, sound to be able to play off of it, to be able to say, hey, there's vape, or it could be the principal saying, hey, we've we've notified or noticed, we've notified security, someone's on their way. Um, you can also have tamper, right? So if I try to hit the device, so here's a tamper, it's now telling you, hey, someone tried to take it off the wall and uh, and it's signaling. Uh, we can also do things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, voice. So help, 911. Help, 911. I'm supposed to play the audio, but the, you can, um, and then. And you could see immediately, I got a, a notification on my phone that someone said help. And it takes me right to the lobby. It takes me right to that uh, camera angle. And you can see the video of that person doing that. And so the again, the integration of trying to make a building smart uh, and a uh, site smart, but also secure. Smart buildings are not just about occupant experience or not just about energy. It's also about having a secure. Um, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, just the lighting control. Um, we've got HVAC control controlling the space. One thing I want to show here is this uh, VAV box controller. So this is a VAV box. A lot of tenant spaces, a lot of buildings, they have VAV boxes, whether it's fan powered, whether it's uh, 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 coil, uh, hydronic coil, electric coil, whatever it might be. And uh, and you have these boxes. And most of these boxes get sized based on a space. So you might have one that goes for this range of 200 to 500, another box that goes from 500 to 2,000 or 1,000. Uh, and so you have all these different box sizes. And so it creates a challenge when you design a space it creates a challenge when you go to remodel the space, are the boxes the right size? So there's some newer technologies out there that allow you to take a box, this box, and you can control uh, cleanly from one CFM to 2,500 CFM. And so you can now control that one size box for a different air spa uh, space however you want. So I can buy two boxes of exactly the same and say, hey, this one is so many square feet, I want it to be 
500 to 1,000 CFM range, my min max. The next one, same box, same size, 1,000 to 2,000. And so it allows you the flexibility. But what it also does is it gives you that same controller to now wire to that lighting zone for that space. And so now I can use that same controller for the lighting control and for shade control uh, for the blinds. And so now you have that truly integrated unified solution at the zone level. And it just goes to show how being able to take something like this that's very versatile, taking lighting and lighting control and, and using that same system, and you just simplify that floor space uh, in the building. And you've given a better occupant experience. There's a lot of VRF, a lot of um, uh, VRF mini splits going on uh, in the in Seattle and the the uh, in the U.S. and so there's technologies out there to do the same thing like this VAV box, but with the mini split or with a, v a VRF, and you can now pull that data out, but not just normal because VRF does have integration, does have control, but it's it's going the next level deeper. It's giving you all the service data. Uh, which is typically a challenge. It's opening up even more data points than what the manufacturers allow. And uh, with this technology, it actually gives you better control uh, over uh, control strategy on auto changeover uh, and interlocking, which is typically a challenge when you look at VRF. And so the solutions can be applied to not just VAV systems, but also VRF systems. Uh, and then to be able to integrate that back to lighting control in the same way. Other simple things I wanted to just point out are, um, you know, things like digital signage uh, and having smart systems with the digital signage and having that also tied to the same occupancy schedule where the computer uh, or the monitor shuts down uh, on the same occupancy schedule. Uh, and then it's all managed uh, remotely. In our conference room here, we've got uh, some really, uh, you know, basic things that we do with the same HVAC lighting control. But one thing that we just implemented, we have not tied it yet to anything, but we will be actually very shortly, is smart tent. So if you look down there, uh, we got a glass wall. And as I uh, click on the smart tent, it opens it up and then uh, untents it. And then now we can give a demo of technologies through the glass. Uh, and when we're done, we can close it up. And so we're uh, integrating that with our access control uh, and then also things like Alexa uh, to be able to, to drive it. One of the really, uh, with a smart office, one of the things that we've all talked about for years uh, and decades, I remember for forever people talking about it and doing this, but it's very difficult, is integrating access control with HVAC control. And the use case is, hey, Craig just walked in the office, he waved his hand, it unlocked. How can we stage everything for Craig's office based on Craig's preferences so that when he walks in the office, it comes alive? And what we've done is we've made that integration but we've done it in a very simple IT level. And that's the thing, technologies today, we're used to talking about BACnet and Modbus and all this integration at BACnet level. It's now at the IT level. So it's APIs to APIs, webhooks to webhooks. Uh, it's the ability to talk to the cloud and make things work together in a much more IT friendly way, which is much more manageable. And so with our system here, we have it where I came in, uh, my access control knows my identity of Craig. And so what we do is store all of our Craig's preferences in the access control. So Craig sits in office A, his preference for lighting control and lights is, uh, is you know, 80%. Uh, his uh, blind percentage is 50%. Uh, and, and uh, his thermostat is set for 72 degrees. All of that is stored in the access control as my preferences because it knows Craig. 
in a control system, HVAC controls, it doesn't know names. And so trying to manage all the names is difficult. So what we do is, is but it always knows spaces. So it knows office A. And so now we're just linking the two to say, Craig came in the office, office A now needs these parameters from the access control. And so as I walk in uh, and I go to my office, I now have the ox sensor recognize I'm here. Um, it now stages my office to the light levels, which right now is at, at uh, 50%, and it sets my blinds to 50%. And so the reality of making that office and that experience come together, but also energy efficient, because you're not occupying space, Craig could walk in the office, but not go into his office, do something and leave. So you don't want to stage his office until he actually enters the office. And so the ability for that interaction to drive energy occupant experience is, is there. The other thing is, is uh, it's all integrated with Alexa. Uh, Alexa, open Craig's office. Now it's going to go ahead and open up the rest away. Uh, I can tell it a percentage. And then also there is an app that allows me to connect via Bluetooth to the same office. And I can now set my blinds, my light level, my thermostat, all via a Bluetooth app, an app talking Bluetooth. And it's talking to the thermostat. So if I'm sitting at my desk and I feel it's a little chilly, then I can change my thermostat right from my desk, right from my phone. Um, it's not remote. You don't change it from a different place, but you change it within that space when you're within the uh, Bluetooth range. So isn't that cool? I mean, that's what we've been talking about forever. I remember Balkan, CBRE, they were way ahead of it doing it at, uh, in Seattle and putting that together. But it was very difficult making all that work. Um, and so this allows you to be able to start to do that. When we have multiple spaces, like my office and two other offices are all shared by the same uh, HVAC equipment, same VAV box, uh, what we do is we look at which space is occupied. If no space is occupied, then that VAV box goes to unoccupied. If one space is occupied, Craig's office, then my thermostat value is what is the, the uh, set point. If all three are occupied, then it'll average out those three stats and give an average between those occupied spaces. Um, we also have open offices. This is becoming a bigger thing, especially since COVID um, and, and with tech firms where open offices, uh, you know, uh, hot desking. And so um, when you come into a space like this, where it's got desks and people come in, they hot desk or they have their space uh, and they share that space. Uh, then uh, what we've done is we've created zones uh, for different spaces. So if we look at this thermostat here, which is, is also our lighting control, I can go to my lighting and um, I can control the whole thing. Um, oh, this one does not have the zone, the other one. And we can control zones um, of particular light spaces and be able to show that this person sits in that space uh, for those lights and then they can dim it for their preferences. So when they come in, it sets a stage for them for their space. Uh, so there's ways we can do that for open offices uh, and the technology. Um, you know, the last thing I just wanna emphasize on this is uh, Every office is different. Every building is different. Some buildings have existing technologies. Some don't have any at all um, for smart technologies. Uh, but uh, everything creates a, there's a wide variety of ways to do it. And it really comes down to the use cases. What do you want? Do you want to be able to see if your conference rooms are being occupied or not during the day? And then just tell the cleaning crew, hey, it's red at night, 
So don't come in here uh, and you don't need to clean it or green is we're good uh, and we do need you to come in and clean it or vice versa. Uh, you know, so what are the use cases that you were trying to drive to be able to enhance your particular space, your occupant experience, your energy efficiency? And then what you will do is work backwards from there. What technologies do you have? How integratable are they? Do they have the ability to be controlled? Do they have the ability to have IT integrations? If not, how do we pivot from that? And so when we look at all these aspects, it's a conversation and it starts with what do you want? And then how do we get there? So having said that, that is the, um, oh, and one last thing. The last thing is none of these technologies I just showed you are so new that they're bleeding edge. This is all stuff that's been out there for a long time. It's been out there for years. HVAC control has been out there forever. Lighting with dimmed off, it's been out there forever. And so when you look at how do we do this? Well, this isn't something new that you should be afraid of either. This is how do we take the existing stuff that's out there and actually approach it from a better approach? That's all. I'm going to now jump over to Overcast, which I normally would have Jay do. So give me a second and I'll flip over. Thanks, Craig. And as you make that transition, um, great. Great walk about the office, really interesting. I have a, um, and before you jump into Jay's um, uh, material, uh, I'm I'm not going to ask the question, which I, clarifying question, which I'd normally ask, which is who in the office holds the poor record for the beer taps, but I, I, I won't go there. But we did have um, a, a couple of, questions that maybe get addressed before you jump into um, into Jay's material. Um, one is, have you kept track of how much correction is required in the people tracking camera each night at midnight? So um, how, well, how is that going? That's a really good question. Um, I will have to find out, but from what I remember when we first started doing it, it, it got better and we kept... Uh, not kept. first few times we realigned where the position was on the camera view to be able to catch the tracking a little bit better. The other thing is, is um, we do have one door that's not video monitored. Uh, and so, but people aren't supposed to use that, but it is a, an, an egress access. And so, uh, you know, people sneak out of that. Uh, so if you don't have every door monitored, uh, it's a little bit of a challenge, but really the video has been very good. Um, sometimes you just have to tweak that line of where you're tracking so you don't catch uh, any kind of false positives of people being by the door, but not through the door. But good question. Yeah, great. And um, so you started this out with uh, opening the front door. And the question is, uh, how does that hand swiping work? How do you do this without your phone? How does it know your hand? Yeah. And and what about a power outage? Uh, what what how, how do you gain access? That's a great question. Uh, first off, the how does it work? Um, the the app itself, you have to turn on working in the background. And uh, so it's running in the background. I've had very little to no impact from a battery perspective. I know some people have had that at times. Uh, and so, uh, but, you know, it has had no problem on my iPhone. Android, I will say we've had a few more glitches here or there, uh, you know, where it just doesn't work as seam seamlessly every time. But, you know, that's a rarity. We have a lot of Android users and we usually work through those. But it's working in the background and it's looking at Bluetooth, uh, low frequency, uh, uh, RF, not RFID, but something like that, and uh, Wi-Fi. So it's like triangulating. And it basically, when you walk up, it's already syncing because it recognizes you're within the zone. And then when you wave it, it says, okay, now we're ready to open. And then it, 
it credentializes, sends those credentials. So even before I wave, it's already talked to that reader to be able to say, hey, I'm here. And we actually had to change the radius because the radius was big enough to catch my office early on, uh, on the other side of the door. So it was letting everybody in just using my credentials. So, uh, you know, little things like that, we yeah. you got to kind of manage it. Fine tune. Yeah. yeah. Um, a couple more clarifying questions uh, in uh, to the audience. We have some other broader discussion questions that I'm going to be posing to Craig in a little bit, but uh, keep sending in these uh, questions in through the Q&A. There's a question about how are you ensuring audio confidentiality in conference rooms, but it's sort of a broader category of privacy in general. Um, so what are your thoughts about that and how are you approaching it? Yeah, so certain cameras, um, you know, like we have a camera in the conference room. Uh, we do not record video or audio on those cameras uh, in those spaces. Uh, and certain like uh, our, our video over uh, where people are working, uh, we black out. So if I show here um, a particular space, uh, there is a blacked out area of where the person's actually sitting. So you cannot see, you know, what are they browsing and what's going on specifically on their desk. Uh, and, and we do not carry the audio on that. So even though it has it, we don't use it. So it is a matter of uh, being sensitive to what space you're in and what spaces, how you're configuring the system. Um, privacy is a big deal. And you like, uh, the halo device that is listening for words there's no recording on that device uh, for audio it's just listening for keywords uh, or aggression or certain things but it's not actually recording it so uh, it's definitely known in our industry of of uh, how do you implement technologies from a manufacturer perspective and still protecting privacy great um so Brad would like to know, uh, would like you to talk just a little bit more about, you had mentioned sort of IT level control versus sort of backnet uh, and um, such. Could could you just expand on that conversation just a bit sure. for Brad? Yeah, so today, typically we walk in a building in the building's market and we say, uh, does that system have backnet, right? That's one of the first things we say. Is it open? Does it have backnet? Sometimes we talk about the old lawn or, you know, mod bus or meters and whatnot. Uh, and that's how we're going to integrate. So lighting control, I get a system handed to me and it says, oh, you've got 4,000 backnet objects uh, that uh, are browsable through the BBMD uh, to, you know, how I read it from a controls perspective. And, and it's all these different individual instances that you can't really decipher. And, uh, but manufacturers today have made their systems more IT friendly. Uh, and so more of the devices uh, like, let's say this controller or that PoE speaker, they have an API that's an IT uh, um, you know, way of talking to the device. And so if you go in around the city of Seattle and say, how many programmers are there in Seattle? How many of those know how to program to BACnet? There's probably only a dozen or two. If you said, how many can talk to an API? Every single programmer is going to raise their hand. So it opens up this ability for us to start thinking, how do we develop stuff and make things talk and have a scale to it, not be pigeonholed to a few people that know how to make things talk. So I've got an API. I can make another API, talk to that API and that API. And I can have a, a, a thing talk to each other. There's these terms called dockers and containers. These docker and containers are, are like little virtual machines. They're little uh, things you can write in no red or whatever and make things talk to each other. So I can have an IT I, API talk to an API to a web hook. Um, I can talk to the cloud. So a lot of these technologies have things in the cloud and there's a whole API up there. 
um, I can use MQTT. So we're actually using that. It's a technology that is made for Internet of Things, and it's a very secure way of having things listen to say, hey, tell me when that door has Craig come in. Oh, okay, I've just listened, I heard it. Now I can feed that information over. And so uh, BACnet has been a legacy uh, and still relevant protocol for controls in the building industry. APIs uh, and web hooks are the future. MQTT is the future. And I can do everything on a certain product line of a controller through an API that I could via BACnet. And so it gives me the flexibility now to be able to do more things. Great, thanks. That's that's super helpful. Um, one last quick clarifying question: um, Is it a good idea to have a panic button next to the HVAC switch to activate Halo for people with special needs? Um, thought through that at all? Yes. Um, the Halo sensor actually comes with a panic button. Oh, okay. uh, you can get a panic button for it. I didn't show it. But you can do a panic button, and then that sends off signals and does things. Uh, and it's very common, especially for uh, classrooms. You know, they can have the panic button on their teachers, on their uh, lanyard, uh, special needs. Uh, you can have it at a reception desk. desk. Uh, so different places where you want to be able to drive that panic uh, notification, uh, and the halo picks it up. So, perfect, perfect. Thanks, Craig. Um, okay, now I want to introduce Jay Martin, uh, who will look uh, very much like Craig Engelbrecht. Uh, and um, I think, Craig, you're going to take a cut at, uh, at talking a little bit about some of the really innovative stuff uh, that Jay has been working on. Yeah. So, I I'm going to talk the best I can. I do have some familiarity with this company, Overcast Innovations. It's a local company, um, uh, but don't ask too technical questions for me. <laughs> I, I, but what what they uh, have done is started rethinking the ceiling. So when you think of the ceiling, we think of typically these type of drop ceilings, or you think of this open space where you just you look up and it's great, but there's stuff everywhere, right? And I even have it in my ceiling right now um, is you install devices and they're everywhere. Uh, and so what they've done and they started on the manufacturing side where, um, oh, here's their mission, design and manufacture um, innovative ceiling products that consolidate building systems, reduce waste and enhance the user experience. And they have an open structure, which is they call the overcast cloud. And what they're doing is they're simplifying the building systems into a smart and an integrated ceiling assembly. So, you know, if you think about the ability to just purchase ceiling appliances that are all prefab, pre-made, but have the components in there with the design that you want to have from the HVAC. It could have uh, you know, a VRF cassette in there. It could have a uh, uh, you know, a diffuser from coming off of a VAV box. Uh, the electrical with the lighting, uh, low voltage cabling, the fire alarm, uh, <clears throat> any kind of distributed cell or wireless, you know, your WAPs, your AV, public address. Uh, and other IoT sensors are building controls. So what they've done is consolidated all of that into these devices or these um, ceiling appliances, an ability to really think about uh, how do we have a cleaner look, but also a more advanced uh, platform for putting all of our technologies into. And so this is really, I see as a huge part of where smart buildings are going is the ability to stop and think about, well, what do I want? What are the use cases? What technologies are needed? And as I go through and, and do a retrofit where I build a new building, I can now can have that consolidated. It's a menu option. It's prefab, pre-built, and then it's hung 
uh, and made final connections. So it's actually reduced in cost when it comes to assembly and and uh, uh, construction cost. This last year, uh, they've now rolled out a grid, ceiling grid system, which takes it to that next level of uh, spaces that will never have open ceiling or spaces that you're retrofitting. And so if you think about like this classroom right here, what they were able to do is just consolidate. You're going to have a grid anyways, but now they can consolidate all of the technologies into smaller appliances. And these grid platform uh, just sets in the grid. They've got it tested for uh, 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 earthquake uh, requirements, all of that. Uh, and it, it um, is... Uh, uh, it's got a great ability to go in and just retrofit and drop in those ceiling tiles that are already pre-hung, the ceiling grid, the T-grid that's already hung. And uh, so with the smart building perspective, this is the platform for you to think about part of your, uh, your smart building. And if you think about most of the technologies, a lot of them are at the ceiling level. Uh, their modular grid platform, the field install is fairly simple. Here that you can see they uh, have put in the grid, T-grid. Uh, they drop the panel, panels drop for full access. Uh, and so from a servicing perspective, it opens up easily. And it has just a very clean look uh, for, your, uh, for your ceiling. It really does help out with the trades because there's a lot of stuff that happens with the trades and things get cluttered and it reduces that risk of, of that all that coordination is required. Uh, it at least reduces some of the coordination. Uh, a lot less waste on site. So you don't have as big a lay down areas. Uh, you, you've had a lot of things prefabbed and pre-done so you don't have as much material, material assembly. And then it also reduces uh, safety uh, uh, risk with less ladder climbs of multiple trades getting up into the ceiling. And so this is where it's the smart office enabler. And if you look at this, uh, you'll see here we've got uh, a, uh, an HVAC controller sitting up above the grid above the appliance with a multi-sensor that's showing occupancy and, and uh, showing the light levels. And uh, you've got your LED driver and then you've got your thermostat. So if you see it looks familiar, it is. Um, and, and actually Overcast was one of the drivers behind some of what we did and how we did it for our smart office uh, and how we've implemented it. And so it now allows you to have that intelligence uh, for lighting, uh, but also the HVAC control. So uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, is there any questions, Stan, uh, or uh, moderators that they have for Overcast? Uh, yeah, thanks. Let's see. Are individual components serviceable, uh, including the LED light strips? So um, what, what, can you address that? Yes. So when it's an open space like this, uh, yes, the, they're serviceable from the top and from the bottom, depending on where you're, <clears throat> what you're trying to service. Uh, it's all modular, modular, modular of how it's even assembled. And so let's say an LED strip goes out, uh, there's ways that they've built this so you can uh, pull that out and put in a new LED strip. So it's not like you have to take the entire thing apart uh, to be able to service it. And when you look at the grid, uh, ceiling grid, there's certain components that fold down and open up and there's certain ones that are accessible from the top. And so if you look at like this image right here, there's uh, panels right here to be able to 
uh, to that drop down to get to the controllers and to the other devices. Um, and then certain things you'll have to go up and above if you're replacing the strip, uh, LED strip, for example. Great. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, th I think that's great. Um, we, we have another question. I'm actually going to try to broaden it a little bit, and maybe that'll actually also be a good segue into uh, a series of, uh, of questions that I'd like to chat with you about, Craig. Um, the, the question is, uh, really having the, the question posed was what can smart system providers do to help IT admins become more comfortable with um, smart and remotely connected systems? But I want to broaden that a little bit to mm -hmm. the question is basically you said that none of this technology is bleeding edge. And so it's there, it's accessible. What's holding things back or what do we need to get to make the alchemy just right in order to see um, the kind of full potential of this market? Sure. Well, we've got, you know, why is this so hard? I, I, I might make some people upset if you're an owner, or an architect, or an engineer, or a GC by some of these comments, but this is the reality I've seen. And um, and why it's so hard to do this type of stuff and you know new construction tenant improvement when you're talking about a project kind of let's call it ground up uh, a lot of times owners just aren't aware of what can be done and they're aware of what they've always had and they just aren't aware so a big part is just being aware uh, and and listening to the technologies things like this to be able to help drive that awareness but uh, architects um, you know when we and I'm going to separate out kind of the overcast and smart technologies. Um, like the smart technologies, architects are only involved in lighting design. They don't touch HVAC. They don't really touch some of the other aspects. Um, although they do care about, you know, occupant experience, um, the, the ability to be able to talk to an architect, usually an integrator like us who has those systems is way down the line. And so they, we don't interact with architects and architects don't interact with us. Um, engineers want systems that have worked prior. Um, they have not developed Div 25. Most engineers that I talk to do not have a Div 25 spec that talks about a master systems integrator, talks about integration and how these work. Or if they do have it, it's very light. And they frankly struggle with what do I do and how do I make that work? Uh, and what do I write? Uh, general contractors, they don't want risk. They are out of their comfort zone when it talks about technologies. So they just kind of push it back down uh, into the divisions. So it gets buried back in electrical and mechanical divisions um, and or the low voltage divisions. And so it doesn't get pulled up to the level of being able to talk about how these interact and what could be done with it. Uh, there's really not in a project, a direct accountability, accountability to design and implement these integrated solutions. You have contractors that specialize in HVAC controls. You have ones that specialize in lighting control. You have ones that specialize in security. You have other, right? They're all kind of their own specialty, but you don't have them really owning and integrating those systems and, and doing it in a way that gives the best outcome. Uh, and these system solutions are not brought to the table early in the design or they get value engineered out. And so when you look at uh, these type of solutions, especially with uh, you know the overcast solution, it's not brought to the table. It's usually brought to the table later. And then they're like, oh, that was a great idea, but we're too far down the path. And so being able to have the foresight and thoughts of, Having those conversations early on, uh, it takes a lot of work, but once you get it, you get your better outcome. Uh, and then you, a lot of times people think it costs too much. So on new construction and tenant improvement, it's a very marginal cost. Actually, there's a lot of cost savings uh, when you start removing systems like the lighting control system, um, and, and it allows you to have simplified simplification. Uh, but it's all marginal because you're 
already going to pull cables. You're already going to do things. Uh, so it, it is not that much. Uh, existing buildings, though, again, owners aren't aware. They also feel locked into existing systems, and they feel like they have to stay with those systems, which is not true. And so feeling the liberty to be able to explore and look at other options and how they integrate is a freeing position that owners would like to have, but often don't feel like they can. Um, electrical and mechanical stay in their lanes again. Um, and then there's, they're not brought to the table in early design. And I will say with existing buildings cost, it does cost more um, because you're dealing with existing infrastructure. Uh, you might not have wires pulled. You might need more cat six. Uh, pulled. You might need to reinforce something. You might need to do this. You know, you got to pull out light switches if you're replacing them all. You can use the conduit, but you got to pull out the cave, uh, the existing wiring. So there's different things there that will cost more, but at the end of the day, give you a better result. Um, so when we look at all this, you know, it's so hard, but it really starts with, are you taking a step back and getting the appropriate people involved early on instead of thinking traditional architect, engineer, electrical, mechanic, right? Getting integrators who have that expertise and know those pieces involved early. They don't even have to be contracted directly, but just get them involved early to have the conversations. Great, thanks. Uh, I, I want to not ask what I think is the unfair question, which is, well, what does this cost? Um, because I think there's clearly too much variability here to say uh, anything particularly concrete. But if we turn that question into framing the kind of return on investment, how do you encourage folks to both think about that, to articulate that, so that if we do have a champion for this kind of thing, um, how can they get the necessary approvals? How can they frame the arguments uh, in order to get to yes? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when you look at, again, new construction versus owner direct uh, existing building, that new construction, it's really if anything, there's some cost savings, there's some margin stacking, there's some system reduction, uh, maybe a little less wire pulled. Uh, there are cost savings. And if there is more technologies you want to leverage that cost more, there's an ability to even some of that out. And it's marginal overall. But, you know, we get it all the time where it's like, well, how much does this cost? And you give a cost for this and they say, well, that's too expensive. Well, they're not looking at the three pieces and we try to explain, hey, it's really three pieces and it's this piece under the electrical contractor and it's this piece under mechanical and then it's this piece down under the mechanical and that subcontractor, right? And so you got to kind of distill that out and, and kind of work through those budgeting items uh, together. Uh, on existing buildings, uh, you know, frankly, the best time to do it is when you know you're doing some sort of upgrades to begin with. Uh, you wouldn't go into a building and just start doing it. You might take small steps like, hey, I'm going to put in halo sensors in all my public restrooms or whatever it might be. Uh, but when you start looking at, hey, my end of life for my controls, I haven't put in LED lighting yet. Um, you know, I need to do a security upgrade. Uh, because we got non-secure prox cards that need to be dealt with, right? Those are the times you can start taking steps towards doing this. And it's really having an integrator that can say, okay, well, maybe we start with this and we stepwise you to this. Uh, and here's the holistic plan, but here's how we're going to get there. Great, thanks. That's helpful. One of our at attendees is... Um posed a question that if a property wants to keep their existing HVAC controls, is it possible to integrate these systems into that existing HVAC system? Absolutely. There is multiple ways to come at it. You do not have to have a different HVAC controls. Um, there might be different ways that we approach it, depending on the system and the age of the system. 
Um, you know, maybe we put Niagara on top of it. Uh, that gives a little more optionality and a little more openness for you from a, a servicing, but also gives us the ability to do more better integration with it. Uh, maybe that system already has APIs and, you know, we can just connect right to it. So uh, it's definitely, uh, there's no one system out there that's the end all be all. So it's really talking about how do you pull together whatever systems you have and be able to, what can you do? What are the limitations? But then also putting a roadmap to where you want to go. Great. I want to talk a little bit about um, tenant improvements. TIs are part of the natural cycle uh, in, in commercial real estate. And to oversimplify things, you've got sort of a lessee and you got a lessor here. What recommendations do you have in terms of a a person looking at for space, what should they be asking? How should they ask it? Uh, and then on the other side of the football, uh, what do owners, property owners, and managers uh, really need to know about this emerging market um, so that um, they can meet customer demand? Customer demand. Yeah, it is a push pull. You know, at the end of the day, who's paying for it? You know, usually it's always the tenant, but it might be spread over TI dollars over the life of their lease. Uh, you know, there's really, it, this stuff isn't for every customer. Let's just say that, right? Some customers, this is the type of experiences they want. This is the type of things they want to drive for, you know, creating an environment for their, uh, their employees. Uh, but also uh, they want to, to uh, drive energy or you know save on the energy because they're paying for it. Other uh, on the flip side, landlords today they got a challenge with empty spaces, and I've heard this more and more from the property management side and the building owner side. Is I've got empty space on the commercial real estate that I have to differentiate between this space over here, or I'm losing tenants and I know it's going to come up for, you know, how do I differentiate? And so there's things like this that you can start to bring to the table to attract tenants uh, and be able to say, hey, this is something that we are going to do anyways. And the, the cost is marginal. I mean, you can actually save money by doing the VAV boxes and the lighting control through the HVAC. Just that alone, you're going to save money than you would do in your traditional TI. And it's a win-win for both sides. So I think it's really both sides knowing that and bringing it to the table and then having those conversations. What do we want? How many years down the road before these technologies really come to define what it is to be a class A um, uh, property? Um, it's it's going to take time. Nothing moves fast in our industry. <laughs> You know, but once things catch on, it does go quicker. Uh, you know, two to three years ago, we, Seattle had almost zero cloud-based access control and video, in, especially in the commercial real estate. And today, over 70% of what we do is cloud-based access control and video. And so that's moved quickly and things like HVAC controls will be right behind it, lighting control right behind it, uh, fire and some of the life safety stuff will take even a little longer. Uh, so some of the uh, groundwork is being laid to be able to start to do these things. And again, you don't have to have all of it. You could say, well, let's start here and then let's make that and that and that work. That's it. So that's going to have more and more momentum here in the coming years. One of our attendees would like us to flip back a little bit and talk about uh, a bit more about security. Um, what level of security do we need here to keep, you know, third party bad actors from interfering with these systems? Yeah, so there's physical security and there's cyber security. Okay. Uh, so to be 100 percent clear on that. Uh, I think that is aimed towards the cybersecurity, um, remote access, people getting in. Um, that, to be honest, is 
you talk to any IT organization right now and they struggle with that. Uh, and it's all about policy, standard operating procedures, and how you manage it. So if you look at most of the big breaches when Target was hacked back in the day, it was because of VLAN for the point of sale machines were on the same VLAN as the HVAC, and that's how they got through. And so having very good conversations with the IT group to be able to say, here's what we want to do. Here's where we're going to air gap it or not. We're going to have one connection to this. Um, here's how we're going to have multi-level authentication. Uh, it can be done, but you know what our biggest challenge is, is the internal employees. Most of the school districts that have been hacked recently for ransomware in Seattle and had their whole network go down was because someone inside clicked something and allowed it to go in. And so that's your biggest risk. And it's really training, 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 awareness. Uh, and that's what's going to help the most. Yeah, that that's a, a, a really difficult since that problem is decentralized. That is, um, yeah. that, uh, says more and more about, uh, about the need for education. Yep. So, um, uh, that's great. Well, um, I'm paying attention to the uh, time here, and uh, I do want to get around to some s sort of crystal ball related work, if you will, uh, Craig. There's undoubtedly a changing workplace uh, here, uh, and the concept of very, but and you've alluded to it. Uh, already in terms of how uh, offices are changing, but the sort of variable occupancy uh, aspect of things and uh, the fact that people are shrinking their footprints, things are changing in relationship to uh, certainly densities. And one that I heard in a really good indoor environmental quality session that we had this morning was that what people are doing in the office is also changing significantly as well. We're not necessarily using spaces now for our cubicle work, uh, but we're coming into the office because we want interaction time. Uh, and that's when we're bringing people together, using utilizing meeting spaces more uh, perhaps than, uh, than we had in years past. So those and a host of other things are changing the way we work and how we work. So philosophize a little bit about how all of these things that you're describing are sort of leaning into some of these changes um, and providing the sort of flexibility uh, potentially for the new office space uh, in the future. Yeah. Um, so let me make sure I understand. The, the question is, is how does all of this kind of fit in as things evolve? Is that the question? Well, how much more flexibility, I think, are these technologies providing to be able to accommodate the mm -hmm. changes that we know of and the changes that we anticipate uh, in what we do in our buildings? Yeah. Well, I'd be a fool to say this, you know, is the magic wand and everything's flexible and great when you put it in there, um, you know, everything has its limitations. Uh, but what I have seen is uh, with a lot of these newer um, IT oriented technologies, the ones that are uh, you know implemented in most of your buildings today that um, aren't leveraged as much or could be leveraged more, uh, integrating these solutions, more and more of this can be done and dealt with uh, remotely. Uh, things can be managed and, and serviced remotely. Uh, you know, we can look at configuring things quicker and faster uh, so that we can pivot. And so the need for having someone in the building to do all of that is less and less. And so leveraging your on-site facilities team but in conjunction with a, uh, a remote team that manages this stuff is never more um, applicable than this to be able to pivot when those things come up. Great, and, and Hannah asked a variation of this question and probably asked it better, uh, thinking about on-site solar, 
thinking about uh, grid interactive technologies as our buildings end up uh, needing and wanting to communicate with the serving utility uh, for demand flexibility. Um, are we talking about uh, integration of the things that you've been talking about today and these phenomena? Um, what do you see on the horizon there? Sure. So all project or all buildings, you do a, uh, a, a large capital upgrade or are new, require load shedding sequence of operations involved. We're already monitoring different loads in the buildings. And so that is um, part of what's the foundation that's being put in place. We just have so low energy that, uh, you know, it hasn't been a big driver compared to uh, California and Northeast and Hawaii. Uh, but, you know, as we look at the grid and the stability of grid and adding more electric vehicles, that will become an issue. And so um, a lot of that's there. And it's really just knowing when to take that command and is that sequence correct or not. So um, I actually don't think we're that far off of being able to, to manage that. That's great. Craig, this has been uh, delightful to spend time with, uh, with you today. I appreciate you um, not only walking us around uh, in a live demonstration, but your, your willingness to, to serve as your colleague, uh, Jay Martin, uh, and present information for Overcast as well. I want to thank the audience uh, for their participation in the Smart Buildings Exchange and remind them that this is just day one uh, of the conference. Day two starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, and we'll have an open and plenary session uh, there, which is focused on the question of innovation. Uh, and so it'll be a continuation of this conversation and more. And so with that, Thank you very much, Craig. And this will conclude uh, the Smart Buildings Exchange uh, for day one. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.